On the 26th of April, 2012, Chutwa T was murdered. He was Cambodia's most prominent environmental activist at the time. He was also a man who I had known for 10 years in the battle to save Cambodia's forests. When Wuti was murdered, he was traveling on remote tracks of the Cardamom Mountains in southwest Cambodia. And he was trying to expose illegal logging. Wuti was murdered because he had become a thorn in the side of the Cambodian regime. And this is because the illegal logging that he was looking at is conducted by top government officials for illicit profits. This might be hard to believe for a relatively small forested country that seems to have embraced green growth, but there is a dark side to the green in Cambodia. There was never a proper trial into the murder of Chut Wuti, and indeed the military policeman who shot Wuti on that day was also shot moments later. So this left nobody to be held guilty and no one to stand trial. There was an international outcry, especially from human rights groups. But the story about Chutwati's murder that is less told is that it occurred inside a conservation area financed by international donors and not far from a hydro-powered dam, which is celebrated for its production of clean energy. Indeed, this hydro-powered dam is apparently so clean and green that it has been able to sell carbon credits on the international market. Somehow the carbon certifier in this case failed to realize that the dam had triggered an illegal logging racket deep in the forest. And the problem is that there are three such dams in the Cardamom Mountains landscape. All of them sell carbon credits, and all of them have attracted illegal logging. In the three years leading up to Wuti's death, over half a billion dollars of luxury timber was removed from this forested landscape. So this brings me to a key point of my talk today, which is that carbon credits are not necessarily clean and green. I argue that we need to look inside carbon credits to understand how they're made. And I think there's a moral argument for doing this, especially when it comes to carbon credits that come from complex forested landscapes. So who here has bought a carbon credit? I would say most of us have. For me, it would have been the last time I took a domestic flight, I would have chosen to offset the flight. It's just, as, it's just so easy. You click the button, and it's remarkably cheap. But I think we all know that it shouldn't be so cheap and easy. So that's why we need to decommodify and understand how carbon credits get made. Basically, carbon credits are all about some kind of measured behavior change. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change has long endorsed the idea of making carbon credits and trading carbon credits. This gave us the so-called compliance market for carbon credits. But alongside this has developed the voluntary market, and that's the market that enables you to buy offsets on your flights. And this voluntary market has really boomed in recent years. Last year, it transacted the greatest volume of credits ever and this is about corporations pledging to go carbon neutral. So in the carbon market, there are two mechanisms in general that enable us to generate carbon credits. The first one is called the clean development mechanism, and this is about changing technology. The clean development mechanism was the one that the hydropower dams I was talking about earlier used to generate their carbon credits. The other main mechanism in the carbon market relates to land use change, and it's called RED+. Plus, and that stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. The idea of RED+, plus is that you change land use patterns and you keep carbon sequestered in forests and land. The value of RED+, plus carbon credits, increased by 30% last year. So these are really hot property. And it's, there's something desirable about credits that come from the conservation of tropical forests in developing countries. But even if we understand all of these things about the carbon market, we still don't quite understand how it becomes a commodity. To make the tradable commodity, what you need to do is measure the behavior change. And this requires certification, verification, and validation of the carbon emissions that are avoided. 
using international carbon standards. So that all sounds really technical. Ah, oh, it's just commodification. But social scientists who study processes of commodification tell us that this is actually a social and a political process. And the key thing about commodification is that it disguises the conditions of production. So, for example, imagine you go to the supermarket to buy an apple. An apple, it's just a pile of apples. They all seem the same, they're generic. Somehow we are subtly asked not to know where the apple came from, not to know where it grew or who grew it. That's the market commodity, that's the magic at work here. And I think the same goes for carbon credit. So that's why we need to decommodify carbon credits. And to do that, I'm going to take you back to Cambodia. So probably most of you know that Cambodia suffered a long and tragic civil war at the end of last century. And for this reason, at the turn of the century, it had very high forest cover. 60% of the country's surface area was covered in forest. And you can see that in green on this map. This high forest cover attracted the international conservation movement. And together, they worked with the Cambodian government to create many protected areas. Now, over 40% of Cambodia's surface area is protected in some way, officially. But there has been deforestation, and you can see the deforestation in red on this map. It's been driven mainly by agricultural expansion. And for the period of analysis on this map, which was between the year 2000 and 2012, Cambodia clocked the third highest deforestation rate in the world at a national level. So it's this combination of high forest cover and high deforestation rates that make Cambodia an ideal candidate for producing red credits, which is about forest interventions. So to implement Red Plus in Cambodia, what you do is typically it involves an international organisation, usually a non-government organisation, partnering with the Cambodian government to manage protected areas, to do it better. And the argument is that with extra funding and extra technical advice, forest encroachment can be reduced, deforestation can be halted, and you get carbon credits as a result. It sounds great, but in practice, I think you know that I'm going to say that protected area management in Cambodia is very complicated. And I know this because I've worked for years on the ground in Cambodia on forest conservation, and this has included some work on Cambodia's most high-profile Red Plus project in the northeast of the country called SEMA. So the SEMA project sold its carbon credits in 2016 to the Disney Foundation. This is Walt Disney, the philanthropic arm. They bought 2.6 million US dollars of carbon credits. And for all intents and purposes, this is a pretty successful Red Plus project. Certainly the online marketing looks very good. But there are three things about this Red Plus project that make me feel uncomfortable about the credits that are being generated here. And what I'm going to tell you, these three things could be said of any Red Plus project in Cambodia, and indeed the region, and in similar settings. OK, so the first thing is that, as I said, in order to implement Red Plus in Cambodia, you have to partner with the government. And project implementation involves extending government power and control over natural resources into the protected area system. In Cambodia, authoritarian power has been on the rise. And so this means that the carbon credits that are coming from this context are not made under democratic conditions. And this rise of unchecked government power also brings risks, especially the risk of corrupt land deals. So this photo is an example of such a land deal resulting in deforestation. It's a foreign company that's come in, acquired land illegally from a protected area, and created a rubber plantation. It's in the buffer zone of the Seymour Red Plus project. So the second thing that makes me uncomfortable about the red credits being transacted here is that they've been very weak on indigenous rights. This image shows an indigenous elder of Bunong ethnicity demarcating his territory. He's worried about encroachment, he's worried about dispossession, and this is because they, indigenous people in Cambodia very rarely have formal land rights. And so his demarcation of the territory is in the hope of gaining formal communal title for land. Except that being inside 
the carbon project, when the Red Plus technicalities came along, it turned out that they couldn't compute complex land tenure arrangements. So land that was subject to indigenous claims or plural uses had to be excised from the Red Plus project. So this might sound like just a technicality, but it's actually a symbolic act which effectively alienates Indigenous people from forested land. And the Indigenous people here are the traditional custodians of this forest land. So Red Plus needs to do better than that. OK, the third and final thing that makes me uncomfortable about these carbon credits is the illegal logging in site protected areas. As I said, it's rife in Cambodia. Most of the time, the logging is conducted by really powerful government officials. And so for lowly park rangers, you either accept bribes or you look the other way when this illegal logging is happening. Or if you do want to enforce the law, you often risk violent retribution. And this is what happened in 2018. These three park rangers were murdered by an illegal logging gang in the same Red Plus project. And one of them was a young indigenous man. So these three things that I've just said about Red Plus carbon credits, unchecked government power, the erosion of indigenous rights and violence against environmental defenders caused me to question carbon credits in general. And at this point, you're probably all saying, why is this woman being so critical? <laughs> we have a climate crisis to solve. What is this going to do to help? So apart from decommodifying carbon credits, I guess the main message that I want to convey to you is that apparently easy technical fixes for solving the climate crisis are rarely going to be easy and simple. And as I've shown in the case of Red Plus credits, this involves the simplification of really complex landscapes that have deep human and ecological dimensions. It also involves avoiding inconvenient truths, such as the erosion of indigenous rights. So rather than focusing on the transactions of tons of CO2 equivalent, we need to think more about moral and ecological issues, and we need to recognise that solving the climate crisis is much more about social and environmental justice than it is about tonnes of carbon. Thank you very much. <laughs>